First Baptist Church here in the courtyard. Isn't it a beautiful day? Amen. That God has given us a day that we should rejoice and be glad in it. We're certainly glad to have you with us today. Whether you're you know here in the courtyard or you're at home watching, we're certainly glad to have you with us today as we come together to honor and to praise our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And man, what a, a beautiful, beautiful day uh, for them to I think I might have overdressed for the occasion. It was a you know, I was thinking it was a little cooler out here than this, so before it's over with, y'all may have to fan me a little bit. But uh, anyway, it's good to see you this morning. God bless you, and uh, thanks for coming out to be with us today. Our September memory verse comes from the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says this, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Our beautiful flowers today. How about this? You can get a good shot of these. These flowers today are given by Sandy Comfer in memory of her mother, Shirley McClure, and also in honor of Bev Stevenson's birthday. And if you didn't know, it's Sandy Comfer's birthday uh, today as well. So what beautiful flowers, Sandy. These are just gorgeous. And uh, also, let's see, there were some other birthdays this week. I know uh, Kathy uh, Hudson had a birthday this past week. Um, I know that Susan Price had a birthday uh, this past week. So we're going to sing happy birthday to all of you. Anyway, let's look at the bulletin.
and together some announcements we have uh, coming up. Uh, October 1st is Bring Your Bible to School Day. And, of course, I don't know which letters will be in school on October 1st, but I just want to let you know that October 1st is a Bring Your Bible to School Day. Also, um, this Wednesday, we're going to be back in our Bible snapshots. Last week, we did a, a, a nice lesson on the bald man, the bullies, and the bears, the story of Elisha. Uh, this week, we're going to be looking at the story of the Good Samaritan. So you've heard that story, but let's go deeper in it. We'll find out why there was such animosity uh, between the Jews and the Samaritans. Why was it such? Why was there such a problem there? A lot of things that you probably hadn't thought much about. So we'll be looking <coughs> on that. Our Bible studies at 6.30. Please join us uh, live uh, for that on uh, Facebook or on Zoom. Uh, some, September is our World Mission <coughs> Offering Month. And uh, you can tell that we've uh, raised $658. Our goal is 1050 So we still have a couple of weeks left to get this in. And uh, help us out with this as we reach our goal uh, for the World Mission Offering. And uh, there's a great bulletin insert. It's got some information uh, for you about that uh, project and other uh, work that's underway thanks to your support of that offering. Our uh, October uh, business meeting is coming up, and your uh, reports, if you have one, are uh, due for uh, October 7th. So you got a couple of weeks uh, to get those in, if you would. Uh, the deacons, the trustees, the Board of Christian Ed, the financial secretary, the church clerk, the treasurer, nominating committee, and pastor all have reports uh, that are assembled for that uh, meeting. And, of course, the meeting will be on Wednesday, October 14th. Um, on October 4th, we're excited that the Boy Scouts will be with us. Annually, they come and uh, take part in the service, and uh, they'll be with us on the 4th. And, of course, after service, they'll have popcorn available. It's their annual uh, fundraiser that helps put uh, kids in camp. And uh, we hope that you'll uh, come out and support that uh, fundraiser. Again, it'll be October 4th uh, after service. Uh, one other thing I want to tell you about real quick, and that is the uh, blood drive is uh, coming up. And we've been really partnering through this whole COVID <coughs> with the American Red Cross and, and uh, made the fellowship hall available to them. And it's been a super success every time. Good people to work with. And uh, so we just want to uh, remind you that that's coming up October 5th. If you're looking for something to do that day, maybe you're retired or, or just going to be bored if, uh, that day and you want something to do, then uh, you're we're interested in working it, maybe volunteering to help register people, uh, help uh, take them uh, through the process. You'd be more than welcome to do so. Just let Miss Susan know. They always can use some extra hands setting up to tear it down. Uh, so if that's something you like to do as far as volunteer, uh, come out and you can be a part of that. Just let Miss Susan West know if you want to donate blood for that. Uh, they are doing the uh, COVID antibody uh, testing that you get that that's one benefit, I guess, if you're uh, giving the blood uh, for the uh, blood drive. They do that uh, free testing as well. So uh, you'll find out if you have those antibodies if you're interested in knowing that. So that's a little incentive. But those slots, uh, there might be one or two left. If they're filled um, and you'd like to be an alternate for that day, uh, let Susan know as well. We usually end up with a couple of cancellations, and when they don't show up, uh, they, they can call you in a few minutes and pop down and uh, take advantage of that. Uh, and anything as far as the uh, youth that uh, you want to uh, share with us today? We've been having a great time in youth. Uh, we continue to meet every Sunday and Wednesday night. We've started that on June 3rd. We've never missed. Tonight we will be back out at the farm and we'll have another wiener roast. So uh, last week, Nagoski sent marshmallows, which was great. Uh, Gesta and Al brought down some hot dogs and cookies. So if there's anything you'd like to, to send with your kid, feel free to do that. But we are going to have hot dogs again tonight and sweet tea. Thank you, Ann. And, you know, I was thinking about bonfires. I'll, I'll share this with you real quick. It's kind of off topic, but it's worth it. One time I was at this bonfire, and every year the folks that would have this community bonfire, they would light it differently every year. And the last time I was there, and every time I hear the word bonfire, I think of this, they, they had that thing covered up with fuel, and they used a, a flare gun from across the way and lit that thing. And you, that was the, the scariest moment of my life, I can tell you that. But uh, anyway, so uh, every time I hear bonfire, and I think about how uh, fun that is. So that's a little bit of the announcements happening around. Please check your bulletin for those of you at home. You want to uh, see the bulletin, you're welcome to go online to our website, fbcravenswood.org. fbcravenswood.org, the, uh, the uh, bulletins are there. Uh, the difference is, uh, for those of you um, at home who are members, you'll also be receiving our prayer bulletin as well. So uh, for our members who receive the bulletin by email or by mail, you should be getting those. If you're not, please let Miss Susan 
Uh, no, the anchor is uh, scheduled to come out as well. Uh, first week of April, some great things in there. I, I was taking a peek over Susan's shoulder as she was riding. I know that she's got pictures of the crane when they were putting the new uh, units up on the roof, which is the reason for the divots in the yard. We're not, we're not growing potatoes or anything, uh, but that's the reason uh, for the divots in the yard. So you'll see some of that. There's some really neat stuff in there, some good pictures and whatnot. So it's a lot of information coming out in the Anchor or Church newsletter. Uh, so be on the lookout for that coming up the first week of October. Well, let's settle in. Let's sing a song. Miss uh, Abby and Ann's got one for us as we get ready for worship. seated as we look into our uh, prayer bulletin uh, for today and uh, you, you should have this there are several people that need our prayers uh, some procedures and whatnot that are coming up that we hope that you'll be able to uh, join in prayer with uh, not only today but this week and I'm going to try and go through these um, let's remember uh, Ken Emerson who's on your uh, your prayer bulletin dealing with some COVID I think it is uh, so please uh, be in prayer for uh, Ken also uh, Gloria Easter uh, be in prayer for her she's back from her treatment so let's remember uh, to keep praying for a uh, glory Easter. Gloria Blackhurst will start her new treatments on uh, Tuesday. I believe she's having radiation, so we'll want to remember uh, Gloria Blackhurst in our uh, prayers today. Also, keep Dorothy Varney in your prayers. You know, we, it, Dorothy is such a blessing uh, to have, uh, to, to visit with Dorothy and, and to, to yak at her, and, and, and she's just uh, wonderful. And, uh, and so remember Dorothy Varney in your prayers. Uh, Sue Miller, uh, folks ask about Sue. She's home now, so praise the Lord for that. Thank you uh, for your prayers for Sue. Uh, Kathy Hudson is due uh, for surgery tomorrow, uh, so be in prayer for uh, Miss Kathy. I see Kathy over there uh, today. Uh, God bless you, Kathy. We'll be praying for you. Uh, Drew Mormon, there at, the, uh, there at the bottom of the bulletin. Uh, he's the little boy that's dealing with the detached retina, uh, losing his eyesight, so we ask you to uh, remember uh, little Drew in your uh, prayer today. And of course, we remember the families that have lost loved ones. We continue uh, to lift them up and others uh, that may be on your prayers. Of course, Damon Sampson. I know Ann was giving us an update on Damon. Uh, continue to pray for him as uh, he's dealing with uh, leukemia. He's uh, he's undergoing treatment. It's, it's several weeks, right, Ann? That, or a couple months? Three or four months of chemo that he'll be having up at Ruby Memorial, I believe is where he's at. So uh, be in prayer for uh, Damon. Many of you remember Damon. He used to come to church with uh, Ann, one of her friends. Uh, so, uh, being, what was that? Vince Cox also had his surgery. So, they got rid of uh, his tumor. So, be uh, in prayer for uh, Vince, uh, for uh, Vince and for some uh, recovery as well. How about your unspoken request with your hands this morning? A lot of needs out there uh, in our church. Uh, so, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings of life. Lord, as we bow together in your presence, Lord, all the, the folks here today, what a beautiful, beautiful congregation, Lord. Lord, for those at home who are, who are joining us in prayer, Father, we thank you for them taking time out of their day uh, to join us today. 
God, we, we intercede on behalf of the names that have been mentioned. Lord, none greater than their other. They're, they're all your children. And Father, for the many needs that we saw with hands raised, with loved ones or friends on their heart, God knowing, or, or maybe even their own needs, Father, you saw the hands. And Lord, we just pray that, that you, you hear those requests. And Lord, as I always like to pray, Father, when you answer, when you answer those prayers, God, we pray that, that you'll just... Uh, give them a testimony, Lord, that you've touched them. Father, we praise you and we give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody says, Amen. 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 God bless you. Let's stand for praise and worship. After this, we're going to get into the message today. Listen, 
want you to think about this as she sings this. I, the end sings this to you. There's nothing greater than being in God's presence. Amen? Amen. Listen to the words here. Go ahead, Ann. Oh, this is good. This is why we're here today. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. God, we thank you for that beautiful, beautiful song, God, touching, touching your ears this morning, Lord. Praising you, thanking you. God, we just want to feel your love this morning. We want to feel your touch. We want to know, God, through the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you're pleased with us. <clears throat> Help us, Father, set aside the things in our mind that, you know, may distract us from your word. Lord, so that we can hear it and be changed. Lord, so that we can become those living sacrifices that you want us to be. Not a dead sacrifice, but a, a living sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah, it's good stuff. Boy, you guys got me cranked up this morning. It's not good when you're wearing a suit jacket and it's 100. It's not good. But uh, it's good to see you this morning. We're going to go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and uh, we're going to be a little bit in chapter 3 and very little in chapter 4 as we look at the title of the message today, When the Church's Love Speaks. Now think about that for, for a moment. When the Church's Love Speaks. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, if you'll uh, flip over there and uh, grab it this morning, and we're going to uh, talk about not only the power of love, but we're going to talk about the power of love in our church. And that when that love speaks from the church, what, what does that say to our community? What does it say to our friends? What does it say to our neighbors? What does it say to you at home when the church, when you think of the church in your community or, or your church, you think about it and, and you see that love coming from there? What, is, what does it mean to you? What is it, what is it saying to us? Uh, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm going to reach verses 6. All the way through 4, chapter 3, okay? So it sounds like a long ways, but it's not that far. Uh, beginning at uh, 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to start uh, this. He says, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. Let me start that again because, boy, that's, that's verse 5. It says, it says, For this reason, for this reason, this is why I'm writing you. This is why I'm reaching out to you in this moment. He said, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. He sends Timothy to them to visit, to find out about their faith. He said he was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted them and that their labors might have been in vain. All the work that we did, I was worried, Paul says, is that it may have been in vain. I was worried about how the devil was working on you. Verse 6, this work is really good. Check this out. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and your what? Love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us, that you long to see us just as we long to see you. There was a lot of care, a lot of care and concern in that church. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all of our distress and persecution, remember, that was nonstop for Paul and Timothy, he said, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. And Paul's telling him, not only do you have compassion for us, but what, what else? You're standing what? Firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we have in the presence of our God because of you? He says, how can I thank you? 
How can I thank you for what you're, what, what, what you're saying and, and, and the report that I've had? How can I thank you enough? Because it's brought me happiness. Verse 10, night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Verse 11, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Chapter 4. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this, what? I love this. More and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And verse 3 A says this. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. May God add blessing to the reading of his holy word. And the message today, when the church's love speaks. When the church's love speaks to us. You know, isn't it good to know... Let me just put it this way. Reverend Richard Halverson is a Presbyterian minister. He said this. He says, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. He said, there's nothing you can do to make God love you less because his love is unconditional, impartial, everlasting, infinite, and perfect. So what's going on here in Thessalonica at this time? Where is Thessalonica? Well, the city of Thessalonica was a, a wealthy city because it was a port city on the Aegean Sea in the Roman province called Macedonia, or where we would refer to today as Greece. It had the Roman roads that connected the other communities nearby and even into the Orient. So there was significant trading that was going on this area. There was also significant military strength because they had not only the means but the ability to travel. While the city was built in 315 B.C., we also understand that it was done at the bequest of Alexander the Great. The Romans took control of the city in 168 B.C., and they divided up the territory. And in modern-day history, I want to tell you this, you know, this Thessalonica place. Today, if you were over there, when I was over there, I didn't get to see it because they sent me home because of the virus. But the city now was Thessaloniki. So if you, if you see it on the map, it's Thessaloniki, N-I-K-K-I, -K -K is what it's called now. But how, how has this city worked out in history, in modern history? In World War I, <coughs> Thessalonica had the Allied soldiers stationed there. In World War II, 60,000 Jewish people were taken from the city and executed. So this is a real place that we're talking about in Thessalonica. But Paul was preaching here on his second missionary journey. And during his travels, he visited the Jewish synagogue in Thessalonica. And what he found was that people who were there were a lot like he and Timothy and, and his missionaries, that they loved God and that they wanted to please him. And I think that when we think about the fact that these people had respect for the Old Testament, that, that, and they knew that Paul shared that, that they allowed him uh, to speak. So the message today, when the church's love speaks. Let me ask you, church. Let me ask you at home. Isn't it something special when we hear something good going on at the local church? Isn't it good to hear that a local church, our church, is, is doing something? It, it's on fire for God. You know, people are getting saved. People are getting baptized. Lives are changing. What does our town think of our church? You know, I, I think about that a lot of the times. What, what are the people here in, in Ravenswood? What do people in the neighborhood think of our church? What, what do your relatives think of our church? You know, I preached a sermon one day uh, on, on word associations. You'll remember that. We talked about, you know, if I said peanut butter, you would say jelly. And we got to the word church. And if you'll remember, there was quite a difference on what association would there be with a word when you say church? Whether it was bell, and some of you diehard Baptists said dinner, you know, and, and, and all that. But 
we said, but wouldn't it be, it should be love. You know, it should be church, it should be love. But what are people thinking when they hear about First Baptist Church? You know, I hope that they're seeing the love that our church has, because love resonates. Love changes lives. Love rolls out the carpets uh, of not only being welcome, but being appreciated, being understood, uh, you know, giving, giving you the ability to be who you are and to allow God to change you. But unfortunately, if, if we're true, a lot, of, a lot of people, when they think about the church or a church in their community, when you ask them about what they think about the church in their community, we often don't hear the word love. What do we hear when we, we ask people about the church uh, or why they aren't going to church or, or why they haven't tried that church? Well, it's words like hypocrisy. It's words like stiff-necked. It's words like judgmental and crazy and maybe even racist or bigoted or homophobic. You know, what do people say about the church? And, you know, one of the things that I always try and point out is that, you know, the world is judging us. We say, well, it's not right. The Bible, even, even lost people, even people who've never accepted Jesus as their Savior said, doesn't the Bible tell you not to judge? You know, the, the lost people will say that to you. But the idea is, is that we can never give the world the chance to be right about the church. You know, and therefore, love not only covers a multitude of sins, but love is what leads to people changing their lives. And of course, what God thinks of the church is really what ultimately matters. We saw in the book of Revelation where the different churches are written and they're, they're either commended or scolded for what they're doing or for not what they're doing. Even the church that lost its first love. See, God's watching what we do as a church because the church is not just the building. The church is the people who go to the building to worship. The people in the courtyard. It matters. In Paul's day, this church in Thessalonica, he was worried because he and Timothy, you know, had been away from them. That, that, that they were on the right track, but there was so much wrong in the world that was going on. There were, there were so many problems in the world going on that Paul was worried how it was impacting the church. And so he, he did what he could, and he sent Timothy. He sent young Timothy, young in the faith, to go and, and to find out what's happening, to try and hold them together. Paul, no doubt, in, in his mind, was thinking the worst, thinking that maybe there were false teachers, thinking that maybe the love they should have wasn't there. Paul was genuinely concerned about the church. But I find it interesting that, that when he, he wrote the letter because of what he heard from Timothy, he wasn't writing this letter in, in this position we read today. He wasn't writing to, to really change anything. The purpose behind this was to commend them for their love. He was, I think, pleasantly surprised. The, the, the word we read in the scripture was there was a lot of joy for Paul in seeing that what he knew could happen was happening. And that's kind of where we get today when we look at our church. I believe that God is happy with what we're doing. I believe that God is, is pleased with the trajectory that we're on. Of course, the virus came along and kind of kicked us all in the teeth a little bit. Forced churches, many, had to, had to regroup. Some had to figure out ways to reach out to people through streaming. That's how we're reaching you at home today. But other churches had to do the same thing. Many churches, and, and including our own, said, well, we, we don't really need Facebook stuff. We, we don't need to do that. But we found out that we did need to do that. And we did need to take the message to people where they are. So no doubt about it that a lot of churches were put into a very uncomfortable situation as to how do we reach people during a time where, where there's restrictions placed on what we do. And Paul, no doubt, by looking at what was happening in Thessalonica, was worried about what was happening in their church because he couldn't see what was happening in their church. So when he wrote them, he, he's, he's talking about the persecution that was going on and all the distress. He was worried that the devil was ratcheting up pressure on them to the point that they would lose the love that he knew they had the potential for. 
But most of all, Paul was overjoyed that the Thessalonians were doing it right. And that Timothy had confirmed that. And Paul said and that that work that had begun was continuing. And his prayer was that it would continue on until the day of Jesus Christ, until Christ returns for his church. You know, I think it's pretty amazing when a community can see their church as loving, as giving, as in tune with what's happening, and being available to all who want to come and to worship, having a desire to love the unlovable, to give hope to the oppressed, to give hope to the downtrodden. You see, as a church, we, we should look at people as opportunity. We shouldn't judge them for their flaws or, or see what they're, they're not, but to see the potential that God has given them. As a church, we need to see trouble as opportunity. We need to see people as fish and become fishermen of men. We should see people as lost souls needing to be redeemed. Even in all the distress, Paul said, we find comfort seeing your faith. I, I hope in my prayer is that people in our community can say, you know, I, I haven't attended the church over there, but let me tell you, they're good people. Let me tell you, they give you the shirt off your back. Let me tell you, they pray for you. Let me tell you, they're willing to call me. We got a letter today. I, I didn't read it at the beginning of the service, but it was from the middle school thanking the church for helping kids with their backpacks and helping kids who were in need. The deacons and men's groups stepped forward and helped them with some supplies that they needed. And they reached back to say thank you. Kevin, I know, that was working with the school from the deacon standpoint as our, our chairman of our board and found out that one of the, the great needs that the school system had was headphones for kids who would be learning with these laptops and using Zoom and this technology where they would be making uh, their conversations and back and forth with their teachers. A lot of them didn't have headphones, and that means not only anything else that was happening in the home could be a distraction, but anything that was said in the home would go out to the whole school. <coughs> and you can imagine how that could be a disaster in many different ways, even unintentional, let alone who walks behind the camera while it's on or how they're dressed or if they're dressed. But in knowing that there was a need for these headphones that had the built-in microphones, they were able to help them, make sure that kids who couldn't afford them would have them. You say, well, brother, you, you got your reward. You shouldn't mention that. I'm telling you, you want people to see your love. But providing headphones, it didn't, to my knowledge, didn't bring one person into the church. By providing a backpack, it didn't bring one person into the church. A few have come as a result of the community kitchen. A few maybe through the end zone celebration. But the vast majority, it doesn't. But what does it do? What does it do when the church reaches out? What does it do when the church gives to missions and supports the world mission? What does it do? It shows the church has love. It shows the church cares. And when the church speaks love, we don't have to say a word. Because actions, you know this one, mm -hmm. actions speak louder than words. Actions are more believable than words. And what other people think of us matters. Well, brother, it doesn't matter to me. They can take it or leave it. But it does matter what other people think. Because we... As saved people, as Christians, maybe the only Bible that someone's ever looking at. What people think of God may be because of what they think of you. And I'll tell you, that's a big burden for a lot of us to carry. I think in the ministry, it's a burden. It's a burden. It's a burden that you carry because you want not only you to behave, but you want your family to behave. You want your friends to behave. Because it doesn't take much. The old, there's an old prophecy or an old proverb that said it takes years to build a reputation and 15 seconds to destroy it. How true. And in the church it's worse. Because the devil feeds people in their mind that the church is not good. That the church is full of hypocrites. You see, the church is full of normal people. The church is full of average people. 
The church is full, full of people who needed a savior. That's who the church is filled with. That's the people who go to church. So Paul gives us an example, and he gives the Thessalonians an example, you know, saying that I prayed for you. He said, this is how he prayed. This is how he prayed for the church. He said, may God lead you. May the Holy Spirit, he's saying, lead us. May Jesus be honored in the work. And that's paraphrasing. But that's his prayer for a church who's trying to be a church of love. You and I need to be led by the Holy Spirit. That doesn't make you charismatic. You know, a lot of people are afraid to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit because they say, that makes me Pentecostal. Well, it makes me charismatic. Well, whatever. You need the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit will lead, guide, and direct you in your life. It's the Holy Spirit who reminds us when we've done wrong. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us strength to do what we need to do. Paul knew that God had to lead. And God was leading this church. And he's commending them for that. He says, for you and me, whatever is in our path, whatever is ahead, God has to lead. God has to be in the front. If anything, the pandemic has taught us all is that without God, we have nothing. God is everything. And as many of you know, I love history. Jen and I are history-loving people. I look at this church and I see its wonder and I see its awe. I love the big steeple and how you can almost see it from, from downtown. Probably could if you got in the right angle. But I think, what if... What if we were able to restore the church to its original beauty? We can look at the church and look around and we can see some of the, the issues that it has. The church is coming together to put a new roof on it because she leaks like a sieve. From the outside, you don't see that, but from the inside, we know. It's gotten better. Gary spent many hours, probably hundreds of hours that nobody knows about catching water in buckets. And, we, and we've done a pretty good job. But eventually, you'll have... A new roof. And I think about how she stood strong for this many years and how that many of you were involved when the fellowship hall came on board. You saw that, that, that there would be a time where people couldn't go upstairs to dinners, that they would miss it. And so you had the foresight to say, you know, we, we need to have a place that people can gather. And while really my understanding was, at least what I've been told from some of the people who were in the know, the driving force was the fact that a lot of people couldn't go upstairs or wouldn't be able to, to get it. But you look at what it's become. Can you imagine First Baptist Church without the fellowship hall today? What activities, what outreach would we have missed without the fellowship hall that's here today? Imagine expanding. Imagine our church meeting the needs of the next century. I told the church when I first started that one of the greatest challenges for me, one of the greatest disappointments for me was seeing the church over on Washington Street that closed and that was sold. Do you, you know the church I'm talking about? The Presbyterian or Episcopal church? Big red roof? Lutheran church, thank you. One of the greatest sad things that I've seen in a long time was a real estate sign in that yard. Because I looked at the roof and I said, it's a metal roof. That means within the last 20 to 25 years, people had hope that that church would be here. That they had <coughs> hope that it would meet the needs that was coming. Fast forward, there's a for sale sign in the yard. No one went anymore. And that whole building and property sold for like $60,000. All of it. Because nobody wanted it. Nobody saw value in it. Nobody saw the history in it. The stained glass was probably worth that. The roof was probably worth that. You see, Paul, when he was writing this church at Thessalonica, the church at Thessalonica, the love was speaking for it. While Paul was worried they were doing the right thing, they were not only positioned for a time then, but for positioned for a time of the future. And even the city still stands today. How do we adapt moving forward into the future? How do we adapt? Do we add a third row of seats into our sanctuary? Nobody in this church, and most of you here, would never have dreamed that we would have a projector screen 
in the service. Nobody would dream that you purchased a $3,000 projector. Nobody would dream that there's announcements that are projected. Nobody would dream that those services are streamed. Nobody would believe that. But God, though he changes not, the culture does. We have to do everything we do built on love. Because love speaks volumes for the church. Love allows us to restore the glory of the church. To make sure that we're in a position to be here for the next 50 years. I was having a conversation the other day with, with some pastors. And we were all talking about how COVID has really forced us to do things that we would have never done in a million years. From, from not worshiping in the sanctuary in every service, to my knowledge, since I've been here involved in First Baptist Church, six plus years now, if you can believe it, it's been that long that I've been here, I don't remember us having outside worship services ever. And if we did, I skipped it. I don't remember one during the six years I've been here. And for the last few months, that's what we've done. We were able to gather. The church has some... Would you ever believe there would be a need for online giving at First Baptist Church Ravenswood? Who would have ever thought that years ago when Amy was in position and was learning about this, this way that people could give online? And some people I know were thinking, we don't need that here. What would have happened had the we don't need that here won out? Where would we be today in this very moment without online giving? What started out as a few percent of, for the total church is now almost half of what the church collects. Where would the church be? See, you and I, we can't see the future. But we put our trust in the one who knows the future. Our job is to love. Our job is to be adaptable. Meaning that we can change if we need to. We can adjust where we need to. But we need to be the church that God is calling us to be. We need to protect the legacy of the church. That you and I, some of us won't live another 10 years. Some of you may not live 20 years. I may not be employed next week. So we may not be here to enjoy the fruits of our labor. But your kids and your grandkids and your neighbor's kids and the Ravenswood community will be here. But I'm willing to bet that many of the churches we have today in our community won't be. You say, well, it's survival of the fittest, brother. Some of those churches need to die off. Well, I don't know about that. But reality is many of them will. They say about 4,000 churches, something like that, close every day or every week or every month in the country. That's a lot. You and I, we're in a position right now with the people in our church to not only set up existing legacy giving that allows us to make the changes that we need in our church to be ready for the next 20 years. You say, brother, I, I don't believe in that. Listen, I'm telling you. Nothing needs to change. You can keep the front of the church the same. You can flatten it out. You can expand it. We need a third row of pews. Because once you get 70 to 80% full, nobody comes after that. Our pews are getting skinnier and skinnier. But people like me are getting heavier and heavier. I'm eliminated <coughs> from about nine rows in our church without really having to twist and shout to get in. Most people won't do that. If you were to go inside the church and you go down each row, how many do you have to twist and shout to get in? Why have we done that? Because we needed more seating. We need to be thinking. I propose in the next year, within the next year, we'll have a vision committee. We'll have people that are younger. We'll have people who will be the people who lead the church in the next 30 years. It'll be the people in the next 20 years. See, some of us may not live to see that, but we ought to start it. We ought to prepare for it. Because if we don't, if we don't, we're going to have a new roof soon that's going to say we're here for the next 25 years. But there was another church who had a roof that said we're going to be here for the next 25 years and they weren't. 
He said, brother, you're depressing. No, I should be exciting you. Because God is blessing our church. He's loving our church. And he's showing us that we're in a position to start making things happen. It was when I first came on board, I asked the church, the one thing that I thought we needed to do first was to move our budget into a reality budget. It was to take our church from a paper budget to a real one. With Joe's help and a lot of frustration and a lot of phone calls, she's gray-headed, you just can't see it. And I have wore her out more than once. Within two years, we should have a fully funded church. That means that you go into the budget year with enough to get through the year. That means if there's a catastrophe in our church, the church survives. If there's a real problem, the church survives. Now that's a major accomplishment. And if you don't know that that's a major accomplishment, it's a major accomplishment. Not for our glory, but for the church's glory. For God's glory. The church is being positioned to last. And with God's love and his blessing, the church will last. And this church will be a beacon of hope. As it has been for the past 150 plus years, it can be a beacon of hope for the next 150 plus years. Because when the church speaks love, people take note. People take note. Now jump down to chapter 4. Paul said, let us continue to demonstrate love. Let us continue. Let us continue on this path. He tells Thessalonians, let's, let's, let's continue what we're doing. Because it's good. Because it's working. Because it's glorifying God. Finally then, brother, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. You should keep on keeping on. This is the encouragement today, church. Is because I want you to see three things about our church that hasn't changed. One is you love people. Two is that you love God and you honor God. And three is that you're willing to do what's necessary at all costs to make sure that that steeple is a beacon of hope for the next generation. It's when the church speaks love that it draws people. I was talking with Kevin the other day. I've learned, I, I love to have meetings with Kevin. When you own a restaurant, it's a great place to meet for lunch or breakfast. He feeds me well. But we were talking the other day. Kevin, I, and I'll share this. And I think you know, I want him to hit on it, but it's true. What if all this stuff that we have been through is, is designed, when this is all over, for us to look back and see that God was there all the time. And he showed us that we need to get out of our comfort zone. Because comfort only lasts for a little while. We might need to get a little edgy. Because we don't know what church will be like in 50 years. We don't know what the government will be like in 50 years. We have no idea. So it's time for us, while we have time, while we have love, while we have you, while we have people who are like-minded, why wait till you die to help the church? When you can help the church now and see it happen. That's where I'm going. That's what I'm hoping our church will rally together and see. That what we're doing today is preserving all of this for the next generation. Because the church is speaking love. Our community is ready to listen. And when all this is over, the people watching at home, you may be watching right now and saying, when this is over, I'm coming. I'm coming to that church. I want to be a part of that church. Listen, you can watch at home, and I know that it's better than nothing. But I'll tell you this, there's nothing better than being in the midst of these people. Amen? Amen. That's love. What a church. If every church had the love that we had they'd be full. If every church had the same kind of love. Church, all we need is love and a desire to draw closer to God. We need to really be burdened with lost people. See the people who are broken or afflicted. See the people who are struggling as opportunities and not problems. Church, we've got to keep the faith because it pleases God. The church at Thessalonica was all in. Now, I know we don't have any poker players here. We're Baptists. A few of you have turned your cards in. Three of you. But there's an expression that they use in poker. All in. That means 
We're, all, we're going to win or we're going to lose. That's how it is with Christ. We're all in. We can't ride the fence. We can't be lukewarm or cold. He said, I'd rather you be cold or hot, but don't be down the middle. we got to be all in. Church, it's time that you and I get excited as we turn this corner of hope, realizing that this church is screaming love to our community. The church is speaking for us right now. God is using me and you to reach people who have given up on life, who's given up on hope, who see the church as a problem. Listen, eternity is too long to be wrong. If you're here today and you haven't formally asked Jesus to be your Savior, you're not alone because there's other people that haven't done that either. You say, what do you mean? It means it's time that I, I get saved that I want to be saved, that I need to be saved, that if I die, I want to go to heaven. If you haven't made that decision, here's your chance. You say, what do I got to do? Will you come forward during the song, and I'll pray with you. We'll pray with you even on camera. Where are you over there? I'll tell you what the Bible says about being saved. And then I want you, after you do that, to get baptized and turn up the love meter and love like crazy. Look at people like you that have made you struggle. Turn up the love meter and pour out the love on somebody who needs it. Tell people what God has done in your life and how you're different. Maybe you're in a place where you've, you've just not felt right where you are spiritually. It's been a long time, but you just don't feel right. Then it's time for you to do what we call rededicate your life. That means you tell God, I want to refocus. I want to redo. I want to make sure, God, this time I'm serving you right. So you can do that. You don't have anything to be ashamed about. That's something to be proud about. That God's dealing with you in that manner. And if you're here and you've been saved forever, church, I hope you hear what did you hear what I'm saying to you today? Don't don't go home and say, Oh my gosh, he's tearing the church down. I didn't say that. Oh my gosh, he said third row pews. Never happened. With man, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Listen, I can't imagine the church looking differently than it does now. But a little flatter roof, maybe, a little wider for a third row of pews, same beautiful inside, white pews. Why not? Why would we not want to be prepared for when these churches that don't adapt and don't change and say, well, we're just going to keep doing what we always do because that's what we do. That's killed more churches than anything else. Be open-minded. Pray. Ask for God's wisdom. And I think, imagining this church restored to its glory. At one time, there was no more beautiful of a church in Ravenswood than First Baptist Church. Now we need a good power washing, maybe some painting, maybe some siding pieces fixed, and we certainly need a new roof. It's time we clean her up a little bit. It's time we polish her up a little bit. Somebody said, boy, wouldn't it be nice to have some new windows? You mean ones that open? Those don't. Those have three inches of things in them. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means it's time. That means it's time that we think about restoring the glory of First Baptist Church. How? We start with love. Love. Love people. God will take care of the rest. You love people. You be the church that God has called you to be, and the rest will fall into place. Amen? Join me in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your message. Lord, today, Lord, we just honor you, and we want to praise you, Lord, from the, from the time Abby and Ann sang, Lord, to, to just thinking about how you, you honored the love at Thessalonica. You, Paul was so worried about them, Lord, you sent Timothy. And his report was that there is so much love and faith there, they're on the right track. And Paul said, don't quit, keep it up, turn it up, abound more and more. God, I hope that when you're looking down from heaven on First Baptist Church and the folks watching at home, Lord, I hope that what you see is a church that's busting at the seams with love, that has a heart full of joy and excitement, 
Lord, that has a longing to be the beacon of hope 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Won't it be amazing, God, if somebody, if somebody looks back and says, if it wasn't for my grandpa or my grandma or my great aunt or my great niece, I don't know if this church would still be here. But what they did back then made a difference. God, help us to see that today. Lord, if we have people with us today at home or here that need to be saved, Father, I pray that you speak to him right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for this, this beautiful congregation today. Lord, I, I thank you for every one of their families. Lord, for those who couldn't be out today, Lord, watching today, we pray a special blessing upon them. God, as we depart, we receive the offering. We pray that you'll bless it and use it to the upbuilding of your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. Hey, thank you, God Almighty.